People are drawn to this. Yeah. Ingrained in American thought is the idea of finding lost treasure. Welcome to Profoundly Pointless. In this episode, we're going treasure hunting. Our guest is one of the best treasure hunters in the world. This is treasure hunter Brent Brisbane. Thank you for joining us. Like and subscribe if you get a chance. Like, how do you get into this? To be honest, I fell ass backwards into it. Um, it was a dream of my father's since I was a young kid. Um, he grew up having never seen the ocean, had never, you know, being involved in any of those kind of things. But he would go to these Saturday morning serials and he would see these swashbuckling adventures of treasure and things like that. And so he had this lifelong passion. And in 1985, when Mel Fisher found a wreck off of, off of Key West called the Atocha, he became world famous. And my dad, you know, was gravitated towards it. And he ended up getting swindled by a treasure hunter in the Keys to the tune of a quarter million dollars in mid-80s money Ooh. of, you know, just some con man, basically, that had a boat and said, you know, if you give me this money, I'm going to go find, you know, just as much as Mel Fisher found. And needless to say, it didn't work out, but that never left him. And so in 2010, Mel Fisher's family was selling the rights to the 1715 fleet along the east coast of Florida. And having that inclination and being, you know, an entrepreneur of sorts, my dad called me up in February of 2010 and was like, hey, you know, I'm thinking about buying this business, but the only way I'll do it is if you partner with me and you come down here and you run it. And I was thinking, treasure hunting in Florida? I'm like, yeah, I'll give that a shot. And that's how I fell into it. It really was uh, kind of a crazy, circuitous route. But uh, nevertheless, it took me where I needed to go, I guess. So, like, the only thing that I can picture, right, is what I think about in the movies. Like, how does this, how does this business actually work? It's nothing like you see on TV. It's nothing like you see in the movies. Um, there are two major motion pictures that were made about our fleet specifically. Back in the 70s, you're probably too young to remember a movie called The Deep with Nick Nolte and Jacqueline Bissett. It's all about looking for the treasure of the 1715 fleet. And then more recently, you probably may know Fool's Gold with Matthew McConaughey and Kate Hudson. If you go back and watch that movie, they're sitting in Donald Sutherland's yacht in the parlor there, and they all they discuss the 1715 fleet, the you know origin of the treasure that they're searching for. And, and so both of those movies... They're searching for something called the Queen's Jewels. It was an artifact or artifacts that were theoretically on our shipwrecks. Um, the story goes that the King of Spain's wife died, and he decided that uh, he was going to marry a woman named Elizabeth Farnese. She was the Duchess of Parma, Italy, and she demanded a dowry before she would consummate the marriage. So he ordered up all these jewels to be created for her down in South America, and as the story goes, they were on one of these ships. And so that provides the basis for both of those movies. But again, it's nothing like you see on TV. It's nothing like you see. It's really hard work. Uh, it's incredibly laborious. It's, um, you know, people think of it as scuba diving. And scuba diving truly is just a necessary evil to be underwater to work. What we do is we excavate the bottom of the ocean. So we go out and we'll dig a hole. Basically, and with my boat, it was about 20 feet wide, and you go down to bedrock, the broken limestone bedrock that's out there on the east coast of Florida, and that's where the artifacts are. They're buried under multiple feet of sand, four, five, six feet of sand, depends on the area where you are. And so you just swim down there with a metal detector, and nine times out of ten, or 99 times out of 100, honestly, you find beer cans and lead fishing samples. You know, it's just, it's not, you know, what people think of, oh, you swim down and you, you know, pick up gold and you come up to the surface and everybody's hooting and hollering. And that does happen, but it's extremely rare. So it's not like the treasure, like when I'm imagining it, right? Like there's this old broken up wooden ship on the bottom of the ocean. With a skeleton at the wheel. Right. With a skeleton at <laughs> the wheel. There's, there's like a crew member in the back and there's just like a chest somewhere inside of the ship. But it right. sounds like more like, no, it's actually kind of like underneath the ground and you got to go dig it up. Absolutely. What happened with our wrecks in particular, they were sailing along the east coast of Florida and a hurricane began to blow. And that pushed them into the outer edge of the reef, which is only in about 25, 30 feet of water. And so once they hit that reef, then the waves just pounded these shipwrecks into thousands of pieces. And those pieces then were pushed towards the beach and northward because of the Gulf, uh, the current and the Gulf Stream. 
And so what happens is these wrecks were dispersed over miles. And over time, you know, they've been out there for 320 odd years at this point. Um, what happened is all of the organic material, all of the wood, the leather, anything that was natural or organic is long dissipated. So there is no really shipwreck. You don't, you know, it's just scattered debris. And it's along the uh, lines of iron, um, you know, all of the iron that affixed the ship from spikes to the rigging. And then, you know, pewters, you know, they had different plates, things like that. Um, all the metals that you find, the gold, the silver, you know, which is what we're looking for. But there's lead and the musket balls, the cannonballs, things like that um, are really all that's left. There's ceramics as well. But anything of an organic nature, the people, the bones, the wood, the leather is all disintegrated over time in the so how do you even go about finding stuff? Like what's the process for finding out, I guess, not only essentially finding out where to even look? Well, these shipwrecks were identified in the late fifties and early sixties. So they've pretty much been known about, you know, people started finding artifacts on the beach. Uh, there's a famous story of Kip Wagner, one of my predecessors on the 1715 fleet. He was a painting contractor. He went down to Florida on a job to paint a hotel. And he would walk the beaches in the evening. And he started finding these little black oxidized round pieces that looked basically like Oreos, one side of an Oreo. He took it home, cleaned it up, and lo and behold, it was a silver coin. And he started asking around, saying, hey, you know, where do these things come from? And the locals were just like, ah, oh, people have been finding that stuff out there for years. And he was the first one that really decided, well, where did it come from? Well, you know, why do these things aren't organically on the beach in Florida. And he got himself a surplus army mine detector because they didn't have metal detectors back in the late 50s. Um, and he took this mine detector and he went out there swinging it along the beach and he started finding more and more artifacts. And eventually he found a, a well that he had determined had to have been dug by the survivors of this shipwreck, finding all sorts of period artifacts from the Spanish colonial times around this well. And he decided, wow, that wreck's got to be right out there. So he got himself a surfboard. And he cut a little hole in the surfboard and he put a window in it and he started paddling around in the ocean. And after a couple of weeks, he spotted cannons on the bottom of the ocean and uh, said, you know, this is it. And that really, truly was the advent of modern treasure hunting in the state of Florida. It is funny how something is so hard to find, but then ultimately ends up being right in front of your face. It's right there. And it was right there. And people, like I said, had been finding this stuff out there, but nobody was inquisitive enough to say, where did it come from? And he eventually went to the archives in Seville, Spain, you know, went to the archives down in Cuba, found out where it was that it was this actual fleet. You know, the 1715 treasure fleet consisted of 11 Spanish ships. Every one of them went down in this hurricane on July 30th. Uh, the hurricane began to blow. And by 2 a.m. on July 31st of 1715, all 11 ships were sunk along the east coast of Florida. And so, you know, as natural as it may sound that, you know, people were finding this stuff and would want to know, you know, want to find more maybe or at least find out where it came from. He was the first to really do that. And so by the time I got into it in 2010, we had very comprehensive map from the Fisher organization where they uh, a gentleman named Bill Moore kind of created a system in AutoCAD to map where we had dug empty holes, where, you know, if anything was found in that hole, it had a separate color, you know, be it a musket ball or a ship spike or gold coins. And we use those maps to kind of say, hey, you know, gold was found over there. Let's no one look there. Let's go dig there. And it's really kind of that blind, that needle in a haystack type of approach. But that's, you know, ultimately what we do on a day in and day out basis. It sounds like an ultimately like an educated guess. Like, well, I think it might be here, but really we have – kind of no idea it, it, it is it, it, that's exactly right and i kind of developed a new procedure which led to my success to be quite honest with you you know what these old timers had done is they would set up on the inside edge of the reef and they would start digging backwards towards the beach and so basically what they did is they took you know one or two feet of sand and they pushed it backwards and then they would check what was there and then they would drop the boat back and then they would dig through the two feet that they just pushed backwards plus the two or three feet then it was already there and so as they dropped back in towards the beach they just kept piling up more and more sand 
And it took me, you know, a summer of saying, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. You know, why would we keep doing this? Right. You know, we're creating more and more work for each other. And so I started the idea of taking the boat as far back as we could, literally till we would bump on the edge of the beach. And then we would start digging and we would dig four five, six holes across. And then when we would pull forward. And so by the time we got to that second row, all of the spoil from our holes were pushed back into these empty holes that were already there. It took, made the digging time cut in half, and it was ultimately the way that we got further back into the beach than anyone had ever gotten before, and that's how we found all the treasure that we found in 2015. So if you had to put like a dollar value on everything that you found so far, what, what would that be? Um, well, I, the biggest find we had was a really, truly crazy story. It, we, on, uh, I had been doing this for about six years. I had over a million dollars invested in this crazy operation, and I had about $300,000 worth of treasure at the time. Now, this $300,000 was getting me on the Today Show, Good Morning America, you know, you name it. Yeah. A lot of publicity, a lot of attention. Everybody I met is like, you're living the dream. And I'm like, I'm going bankrupt. You know, I'm 700 plus in the hole. And 2015 was our anniversary season. You know, I had hopes from the time that I got into it that something good would happen. You know, just, you know, from the powers that be. And lo and behold, this is going to sound crazy, but you can look it up. On July 30th and 31st, exactly 300 years to the day that the ship sank in a hurricane, I found 350 gold coins worth $4.5 million on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. What was that like? It was incredible. It changed my life, obviously. It was, uh, you know, I refer to it as being magical. There's a feeling that you get, a high that you get when this thing happens that I really can't describe or articulate. It's, uh, it's such a special feeling. The first night, none of us slept. You know, we couldn't wait to get back out there the next day to see what, it, what more was there. Um, and it was interesting because it was the 300th anniversary, there was a large group from all over the world that had come to Sebastian, Florida to celebrate this anniversary, you know, aficionados of these shipwrecks. And so the night of the 30th, they had a big dinner at a local restaurant where I happened to keep my boat. And so we were all there and we were, you know, three sheets to the wind almost and certainly had a couple of cocktails to celebrate. And uh, I went up and I had had a table reserved at this dinner, you know, right up down in front. And so we're kind of standing in the back watching the proceedings. And the guy that put it on, he calls me up to the front, I, you know, so I get up there to the dais and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm sorry I couldn't be here tonight. And then I immediately thought, well, that's kind of stupid. I, since I'm standing here, I guess, you know, that sounds crazy. I'm like, <laughs> but we had some things happen today. And I'll never forget uh, Mel Fisher's daughter. Her name is Taffy Fisher. She was there. And Mel Fisher had a very famous saying, today's the day. Because in treasure hunting, today is not always the day. And, but you have to believe it. Yeah, it's the only thing that kind of keeps you going when you're, you know, $700,000 in a hole and doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And so she screamed out, today's the day. And I responded, yes, today was the day. And the whole room exploded. And so needless to say, the next day we had a lot of people on the beach watching us and, you know, keeping an eye on what we were up to but it was uh it was a surreal experience it was magical it was uh in time of great celebration i was happy for all of my crew you know they only worked for a share of treasure they didn't get paid a weekly stipend or anything like that they had come to me you know i had previously paid crews and these guys came to me and they said we don't want money we want treasure and so in 2014 you know they didn't do so well you know they worked all summer and then they got you know couple of silver coins, a couple of musket balls, that kind of thing. But it really paid off in 2015. And um, it's an experience I'll never forget. So how does that work in terms of like who gets what, right? Like do you have – if you find finders keepers? Okay, my company has a federal admiralty claim over these shipwrecks. So the ultimate control of these wrecks is the United States District Court for the Southern District of Florida. And that was – earned basically fought for by mel fisher my predecessor he filed a case in 1979 and what you do maritime and admiralty law is very old and archaic and it really hasn't been refined all that well so you go into federal court and you sue the shipwreck okay so you launch a lawsuit against certain unidentified shipwreck located at such and such a location and then you have to put out a public notice that anyone that's got a claim to these shipwrecks needs to come forward in this case and state their claim now, what constituted, you know, public notice in 1979 was a 
you know, advertisement this big in the Fort Pierce newspaper. So the Kingdom of Spain was unaware of this, these proceedings, and they did not intercede. Nowadays, they would, and they would ultimately get the rights to these wrecks. But because they didn't intercede at the time, the state of Florida was the only other intervening party. And it went all the way to 1983 was a settlement agreement uh, that was reached between Mel Fisher and the state of Florida. And under the terms of that agreement, we have permits with the state of Florida, which enable us to go out there and do what we do. And in exchange for that, we agree to donate 20% of what we find to the state of Florida to put in their museum, to study, to lend out the universities, those kind of things for archaeologists. And so it's basically, you know, a finder's keeper situation for me. <laughs> no one else, you know, if they go out there, it's, it's illegal to do so, particularly within these areas. But anywhere else in Florida water, it's illegal to hunt for treasure. And the state law in Florida is if you bring up anything over 50 years old, it's considered an antiquity and there, therefore belongs to the state of Florida. So in the case of my wrecks, you know, I own them in, you know, exclusively other than the state donation. And then as far as my crew, we worked out a percentage ahead of time of what they would gain if, in fact, we found anything. And in 2015, we did and they all did very well. So for like throughout the industry, right, like if you looked at treasure hunting as an industry, are there a lot of people doing this? There may be, but they're very quiet about it if they are. It's virtually illegal now to do this anywhere in the United States of America. The U.S. signed into international treaties and uh, Submerged Cultural Resources Act and different things um, whereby – you know, if we lose a nuclear submarine, we don't want China going out there and picking through it. And so as a result of this treaty, it basically says that if any ship can be, you know, proven that it's, a, you know, a, owned by a, a, any kind of, you know, nation, then it belongs to them. And by virtue of sign, the United States signing on to this treaty, basically it made treasure hunting like this illegal throughout the United States. Uh, there's a perfect example. There's a company called Odyssey out of Tampa, Florida, and they found a wreck called the Black Swan. It was out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, not in any com country's territorial waters, and they spent millions of dollars going out there and using ROVs because it was so deep to pick up all of this treasure. They brought it back to Tampa, and they went into federal court, much as Mel Fisher did in 79, and they tried to claim this. Well, Spain came along and said, no, that's ours. And ultimately, the United States courts gave it all back to Spain. No finder's fee, no thank you. They sent two you know, jumbo uh, planes from the Air Force over, and they picked up all of this silver and gold and took it back to Spain. And so that's basically the law now that control it. And so it's incredibly rare and incredibly difficult to find a permit in the United States to actually go out and salvage historic shipwrecks, particularly of Spanish origin. Can people, is this though something that like you could do this illegally and it's enough of a kind of a draw that somebody might kind of do that way and then try to sell it on the black market? I'm not naive enough to think that people don't. Um, but it is an incredibly difficult process. As I said, you know, in the case of ours, you know, all the gold that I found was under multiple feet of sand. And so you have to go out there and you have to be able to excavate that sand. And so the way we do that is Mel Fisher pioneered a device that they call a mailbox. It's basically an aluminum tube that you swing down over the propeller of the boat and you use the engines, the force of that water to blow the sand away to excavate. And so these boats are very noticeable. Anybody, you know, we anchor on four points, two off the bow, two off the stern. And it's really obvious if somebody's out there doing this. And so I'm not naive enough to think that people don't swim around with metal detectors, but uh, what I consider the low hanging fruit, the things that are laying on top of the reef, for the most part, have been picked up over the last 50 years. And there are certainly other areas of Florida where people do this as well. But, uh, there, you know, really is no legal way. So I would have to think that uh, anybody that is doing it is doing it, you know, on the down low. So the name of the fleet is the 1715 fleet. That's the name. That's of correct. It? The is 1715 there... plate fleet. Plata basically was the Spanish word for silver. And so, you know, it was m mostly silver. And that's the name of the fleet that has become known as today. And 
the reason that they were able to determine where it came from, Kip Wagner and, and the you know old timers that were doing this, when they went to Seville, Spain, they found a uh, map made by an English cartographer named Bernard Romans. And he had you know charted the east coast of Florida. And he made a little notation across from the St. Sebastian River. And it said, opposite this river perished the admiral commanding the 1715 plate fleet. And that's how they were able to determine what this fleet was and then go into the archives, research how many vessels it was, how much gold and silver had on it, who were the captains, who were, the, you know, those sorts of things. And that's, you know, that's where the story gen er, originated. So how much more invaluables do you think is down there? To be honest, no one knows. No one has any idea. There are crazy, crazy numbers thrown around, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, if I was to be perfectly frank, I don't believe that's the case. Um, I mean, worldwide, maybe there are, you know, but, you know, the, the shipwrecks that were, you know, there's millions and millions of shipwrecks all littered all over the ocean. Uh, very few of them were carrying, you know, vast hordes of precious cargo like these. You know, what had happened was the... Spain had, you know, basically colonized, you know, Central, South America, Mexico, and then they enslaved those peoples and put them to work in their mines. And so they were producing this gold and silver down there. And then they were shipping it back, you know, through Havana, Cuba, um, on its way back to Spain. And so the vast majority of sunken Spanish treasure is either off the east coast of South America or Central America, around Cuba, or the east coast of Florida. Now, when you look kind of worldwide, you know, obviously the United States has pretty strong rules about it. We talked about that. But are there places in other countries where like, oh, no, they're really doing this pretty actively there? Well, you know, uh, there is a wreck that was found. It's, I believe it's called the San Jose. And um, I want to say it's off the coast of Ecuador. I'm not 100 percent of that. But, uh, you know, it is a government operation now, and they've taken over the, you know, the finding of it. Some some individuals found it, but then the government took it over. And so they are, as far as I know, actively salvaging these wrecks. Um, but as far as, you know, any permitted operations that are really truly legal and above board, the, the, there's a small operation going on in the Bahamas. The Bahamas have had a long history of treasure salvage and then barring treasure salvage. And the Bahamas, their politics are very crazy, and they, over, you know, the government turns over every couple of years, and so they go back and forth. But there is an operation down there now. A friend of mine named Danny Porter is the one that basically runs the operation, and uh, they're, you know, salvaging to this day, and they're finding some truly amazing artifacts. Now, unfortunately, they're generally looking, you know, they've got permits for a wide swath of the ocean, but the main wreck that they've been working is a wreck that was found years and years ago. And so, you know, there's not a, you know, a mother load, so to say, that they're going to really stumble across, at least in my belief. I'm sure that they do. But they're picking up incredible and amazing artifacts along the trail. Is Spain like the only people that were doing this? Or, like everything, or is everything just a compilation of they were doing it and they had the records for us to potentially no it was primarily spain you know back in the from the 1500s through you know the 1700s spain was the dominant maritime power in the world and in the in the explorers you know from columbus you know right on down to pizarro pizarro is the one that went down to south america basically conquered the inca um took over their mines took over all of their gold and began shipping it back to spain so like this coin here was made in Lima, Peru in 1711. And so we find a lot of gold from uh, Lima, Peru, a small amount from Cusco, Peru, and um, Bogota, Colombia, Mexico City. And so the Spanish, you know, they had colonized, you know, basically the West, and they were bringing up their valuables and sending them back to Spain. And there was no one else really doing that at the time. And so, yeah, all of the treasure out there is basically Spanish origin. So that the coin that you held up, like how much would that individually be worth? This coin is what they call an eight escudo. So it was the largest denomination coin that they made. Uh, it weighs about an ounce. So an ounce of gold is worth about two thousand dollars, but this coin is anywhere from twenty to twenty five thousand dollars. You just keeping that in your house? <laughs> I keep it in my wallet. People think I'm crazy. I tell them it's my business card. But uh, yeah, I actually you know bring it out and drop it in people's hands and. 
you know, it, it really is a, a visceral experience when you drop it into somebody's hand and they feel the weight of it and they look at it. It, it's, it brings them to kind of a magical place of, you know, touching lost treasure and thinking about where it's been. Like, if you think about it, you know, this coin was made in Lima, Peru. It was put on a ship on the west coast of South America, sailed up to Panama, unloaded, put on a mule, hiked across the Isthmus of Panama, put on another ship that then took it to Havana, Cuba, and then, you know, shortly thereafter ended up in a hurricane on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean along the east coast of Florida. The history of it is fascinating, right? Like, where has this stuff been? Who has touched it? How did it get made? Like, it's it, right? it is, and that's what really draws people in, because um, you can sit and think about it, like that journey I told you of this specific coin. And if you think about it, there's a little context that I try to give to people, which people always are kind of blown away by. This treasure sank in 1715. It was sitting on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, 17 years before George Washington was born. <laughs> so that just gives you some context of what was that, you know, what America was, you know, there were real, really no settlements in Florida other than St. Augustine, the Spanish had a settlement there. And so it was basically the eyes Indians were the only inhabitants of this area of Florida when all of this treasure went down. Um, are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Absolutely. How much does it cost you just to essentially look for the treasure? You know, we spent... I bought my boat. I probably put maybe $120,000 into buying and building this boat. Um, so, you know, obviously that's a variable. You've got fuel, you've got metal detectors, you've got crew costs, you've got, you know, dockage, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, so I can't put a specific number on it, but I would say on average, you know, we're between fifty dollars and $100,000 a year. And that's just for my boat. Now, our operations are kind of unique in that, we allow others that want to go out there and do this to work our wrecks and our permits. So if you've got your own boat and you've got your own crew and you want to go out there and do this, you know, we sign what we call subcontracts with people. And basically that gives them the right to go within our permitted areas and search for this treasure. And the deal is if they find anything, we split it 50 50 after we make that donation to the state. So, you know, I've got operations where, you know, Mike Perna is one of the best treasure hunters that are at, is out there. And he probably spends less than 10000 maybe $12,000 a year on his operation. And the last four or five years, he's found the most treasure of anybody. So it's wildly disparate, you know, what people can spend. You know, you can outfit it with as much technology as you want. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's really about digging holes and seeing what's at the bottom of it. But is there enough to be found that somebody could make like a decent living if they were being successful or is like i no. did <laughs> but it's a rare you know occurrence most people don't make mo a lot of money you know there have been years where subcontractors have made money um good money there's a family called the schmitz that went out there and in 2015 they found the most valuable coin that i had ever been a part of and you can put some pictures up of it it's uh, called the, the tricentennial royal a name that I came up with because it was from 1715. And what a royal is, it's the same as this coin, same weight. But as you see, this coin's very imperfect. You know, it's misshapen, it's yeah. not round. At the time, all they cared about was the weight and the purity of the gold. So they would clip the blank, they would file the blank, get it to the right weight, heat it, smack it between two dies, and whatever came out, came out. But these royals were perfect examples of the coinage of the time. And they were made for the king of Spain himself. And so they were made as presentation pieces. They're extremely rare and they're extremely valuable. We found nine of them in my hoard on the anniversary. But the Schmitz earlier in that season found one. And it was from 1715. And it was a, just an incredible, beautiful, beautiful coin. And we ended up selling that coin for $425,000 for one ounce of gold. So, are, I mean, are you, man, are you selling it then at, like at auction or are you just trading it in for the price of gold or how does this kind of work? Basically, uh, private collectors are the ones that are the most enthusiastic about it. And so, you know, it's really wealthy people with, you know, probably too much money that, you know, buy these coins for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then the more mundane run of the mill coins is, you know, something that we call basically a bogey two, a Bogota two escudo, which is a quarter of an ounce. They sell anywhere from, you know, six to $8,000 and people, you know, some of them, if they're nicer and they have unique dates and things like that can go for far more. But, you know, what people do with a lot of those is they made jewelry out. 
people love to hang them for, as pendants, you know, women particularly, earrings, those kind of things. So um, we do know, as I said, donate some to the state of Florida for their museum, but the vast majority of it is sold to private collectors. Biggest treasure ever found. Is yours the biggest treasure ever found, or is there another one that's the No, biggest? it would have to be the Atocha. Okay, in 1985, I mentioned earlier Mel Fisher, my predecessor, he found a wreck off of Key West called the Atocha. And it was estimated to have $400 million worth of treasure on them at the time. Now, again, in treasure hunting, you know, numbers can be greatly inflated and exaggerated. I don't believe anybody saw $400 million in treasure. Um, but, you know, they, you know, this treasure still trades hands. And a one ounce silver coin from the Atocha sells for $2,500. So more than the, an ounce of regular gold. Um, and you know, so, you know, those coins are still on the market today. The Fisher family is still out there actively salvaging the Atocha. Um, you know, they haven't had any returns like that since 1985, but, uh, you know, they find really amazing artifacts. Biggest treasure still out there. Is there one that you would say like, ah, oh, this is, this, there's, that's still I can't there. put my finger on any specific one, but to find one of these, you know, plate fleet vessels or, you know, Spanish racks that were loaded in, with treasure as a virgin wreck would be amazing. Like this one that I told you about down in South America. I mean, I believe that will probably be the, you know, the biggest find in modern times simply because it's all intact. You know, the deeper, the, the wreck that the, you know, Odyssey group found out in the middle of the Atlantic, the wrecks all kind of in one general specific area. It went down more like you think of a ship intact that sank to the bottom. As opposed to what we do, we're picking up pieces that are scattered for miles and miles and miles. So there's no, you know, you know, generalized mother load. It's just we're picking up piles here and there from different things. You know, like all the gold coins I found in 2015, we theorized probably came from a chest. Um, so, you know, all the wood, the organic material is long gone. And all these coins are scattered in about a 20 by 20 foot area. Um, but as far as a, a big something to shoot for... Uh, I couldn't really put my finger on any specific wreck or anything like that. I guess if people knew about it, they would probably have found it already, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I get calls from people all the time telling me they know oh, right where it is. And I like to tell people that I don't know a treasure hunter in the world that knows where treasure is and isn't out there going like this, you know, trying to get at it. So there's a lot of con artists, I'll be perfectly frank, that get drawn to the treasure industry. Um, it's an easy sell. You know, people are drawn to this. I don't know if it was Disney or Robert Louis Stevenson, but ingrained in American thought is the idea of finding lost treasure. And so to be able to sit in a bar and hold up one of these coins and say, hey, if you know, you give me 10 grand, I'm going to go find a million dollars worth of this stuff next summer. It's a really easy sell. And unfortunately, that draws in con men. And I made it my mission once I took over to try to weed those people out and not let them out there because it just gives a bad name to everybody. It's basically a con and I just didn't want to be a part of it. Best movie or TV show about tr treasure hunting, worst movie or TV show about it. <laughs> I would say uh, the deep is my favorite. It's the first rated R movie that my father ever took me to. Uh, again, it was his fascination with this kind of thing. And in, I think it came out in 1977, which would have made me nine years old. And uh, he took me and my brother to see this because he had such a passion for it. And I really enjoy that movie. Um, the worst, you know, I, I'd have to say, may, you know, uh, Black Sails, you know, it was an interesting story about pirates in the Bahamas and all that was true as far as their actual, you know, they use our fleet again and that is the basis of their storyline. They're looking for the, uh, um, one of the ships from the wreck. And the Urca de Lima is the, the ship that they use, but the Urca de Lima didn't really have any treasure on it. And so, you know, it's, you know, that, obviously I'm getting into the weeds and being very specific about it. But, uh, yeah, those would probably be my two. Obviously, you know, you find like what I think most people think about is like treasure, which I think like silver or gold. But what else? What else? What other kinds of things do you generally find when you find stuff like this? Find every single thing that you can think of from life on a ship at that time. So. It may be rigging, you know, the, the dead eyes that the rope was, you know, pushed through that you see on the side of ships, which are basically big wooden round pieces that have, you know, three holes in them with ropes going through them. Um, they had iron around them, which would affix them to the rails. We find a lot of iron 
we find cannonballs, we find cannon, we find musket balls, uh, we find arquebus, we find, you know, silverware was made of silver at the time. We find silver spoons and silver forks and plates, um, you name it. We find jewelry, a lot of rings, you know, and it's amazing how small the Spanish were at that time. I mean, a ring that we find will not fit below my knuckle on my pinky, um, even the men's rings, because they were such tiny people. Um, so everything that you can possibly imagine, you know, the olive jars, basically I tell olive jars are ceramic jug with a hole in the top of it. And I refer to that as the Tupperware of the time, you know, any liquids, any grains, any things like that, that they were transporting, they would put into one of these earthen jugs with cork on the top of it. And so we find broken pieces of pottery all over out there. So you know, anything that you can imagine that was on one of these ships, we find sword handles, you know. Um, so, you know, it runs the gamut. But, yeah, the, the, the gold is what everybody seeks. Is there a market for all the rest of that stuff? Absolutely. Yeah, people are fascinated with the idea of sunken shipwrecks. And so I know the fishers sell, you know, musket balls, little lead musket balls for $15 a piece in their museum. Um, I take mine and I hand them out to people that come to my house, you know, stuff like that. Uh, to anybody I meet, I'm like, here you go, take a little souvenir. Um, broken pieces of pottery as well, I hand out to, you know, people that come by. So it, you know, it just kind of depends on your perspective. I've never been solely focused on the monetization of these artifacts. I like to share it, but obviously the goal, you know, I did my best to monetize. That's pretty much all the questions we got, man. Is there anything that you think we missed or? What's kind of coming up next for you? How can people get a hold of you? Find out more, that kind of stuff. They can, you know, go to brentbrisbane.com. I do some speaking engagements and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I gave a TED Talk back in 2015 about my experiences after we found the treasure. And then 1715 uh, 1715treasurefleet.com is the uh, website for the company. And if you're interested, you know, to become a subcontractor, and I'll be honest, I get a lot of calls from a lot of people that all want to do this. And I usually tell them they're crazy. They don't know what they're talking about because it is extremely hard. And, you know, usually people come and they spend a lot of money and they go away angry at me or, you know, anybody else and put them out there because it's just not as easy as it looks on TV. And so uh, we do welcome people. I mean, calls from Navy SEALs. And, you know, one of the most important things I will tell you about this, it's all about metal detecting. I would tell these Navy SEALs, have you ever used a metal detector? And they'd say, no. I'm like, I've got no use for you. I mean, we're digging sometimes where I found my treasure was 20 feet off the beach and six feet of water. So you don't need to be a scuba diver. You know, you need to be a scuba diver to be breathing underwater, but you don't have any technical, you know, aspects of scuba diving that you need to know. It's all about metal detecting, and that's who I would hire. I would hire guys that we saw on the beach that are out there swinging a metal detector all the time looking for different things. You know, they're fascinated by it. They live it. They really breathe it. Those are the people that make good treasure hunters. The average person just wants that moment of coming, breaking the surface and holding up that gold coin and saying, look what I found. That's not what it's about. It's really hard work digging through broken shells, you know, turning over big, heavy rocks, you know, cutting up your fingers, cutting up your knees. It, it, it's uh, it's not at all romantic. What's the most valuable thing that you've ever just found? I mean, it's money, but it's I I found a fifty dollar bill once outside of a movie theater. Did you try to find who the right owner was, or did you just immediately pocket it and move on? Yeah, no, I I just pocketed it because with money, it's I mean, unless somebody's you know staring at it and coming back up to you saying, "Hey, that's mine." I mean, it's kind of hard to pinpoint it. I think I found a hundred. I think that I was in Vegas and found a hundred. It might have been a fifty, but I think that it was a hundred, no. and that's the most valuable thing that I've ever found. I did find a, an earring, but I'm pretty sure it was just a a non real diamond, and I just threw it away. So you just threw somebody's thing away. <laughs> You, did you literally put it in the trash? You know, I, I mean, I, I, I picked it up. I waited there for a few minutes uh, where I found it. Nobody came up to me. Then, I mean, there's so many businesses. So what was I going to do? Walk into every... Not throw it in the trash. Walk into every like business? It, no, just like put it down on a railing or something. Like now there's no chance of anybody finding that. Well, I found it in my city, in Madison Heights, Michigan. So I Oh, you finally admit that you don't actually live in Detroit. Thank you. I mean, or was I mass? Maybe I was 
Oh, now he's trying to backtrack. What amount of cash do you find on the ground before you're like, oh, I found something? Like, how much money does it take for you to be pretty excited that you found money on the ground? I mean, it's always great to find something. I don't want to make it seem like if I find $5 that it's nothing. But, I mean, if I find a 20, I'm feeling pretty good. Oh, if I found a dollar, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm like, oh, that's a dollar. I literally, that's the only time you don't really have to work for money. Do you ever, you ever you just uh, find it on the ground? Otherwise, you got to do something one way or another. There's that coin thing that if you find a coin heads down, you, you don't pick it up. Do you do that? Or if you see a coin, you pick it up regardless? I'm not picking anything coins off the ground. Oh. I wouldn't. I'm No, I don't do that at all. Would you ever pick up food off the ground? No. Oh. Have you picked up food off the ground? <laughs> no. Although I have always thought that if I was like a waiter or something like that, like some of that food, like, you know what? You really didn't eat. You took like two bites out of that burger. I could cut the back half off and eat it. <laughs> I really do feel like that's a waste. I really think that like, hey, does anybody? I have always felt like that in a restaurant and been like, hey, you know, I didn't eat this. Does anybody want this? I, was actually, I, I hate wasting food. I was talking to a coworker of mine who used to wait and said that that was the most disheartening part of working in that industry for him was all the food waste at the end of the night. All the people that would just order order a hamburger, like you said, not touch the fries and eat a quarter of the burger and then throw it away. But if somebody was, okay, if you were at a restaurant and somebody just kind of came up to your table and was like, look, hey, I didn't eat this. I took two bites out of this. Do you want the rest of this? Would you take the food? I mean, I'm going to say no, but I I would want to say yes. Yeah, that's how I feel. Like, I feel like I would have to say no because I'm probably there with somebody who's going to judge me and shame me into <laughs> making sure that I don't get it. But internally, I do feel like, yeah, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, listen, two bites and you're giving me, you know, whatever. Sure. If I have a couple of beers in me, I'll, I wouldn't even hesitate. I'd probably take it out of your hands before you even asked me. Yeah, if it's a sandwich that's cut in half, and they, if it's already cut in half, if it is already kind of separated in any way, I would have no problem with it, right? Like, hey, I ate two of these pancakes, but I got another one here that's untouched. <laughs> Do you want this? I'd be like, yeah, I'll take that. If it's untouched, <laughs> if I can segment it in a way that is untouched, I'm completely okay with it. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't know about the pancake thought process, but uh, I mean, even if someone gave me like a, a a burger that had two bites out of it, and I had to cut it, I, I would cut it. I'm fine with that. I have no issue doing that. The only thing with the burgers, you could say, well, they touched the other part of it. I don't care. But I mean, if people at barbecues and stuff, like there's food that's just sitting out there for hours, and everybody's <laughs> okay with that. I will say this about germs: is that I used to not care at all, and then the pandemic happened. And now I find myself washing my hands using, you know, uh, um, antibacterial soap, like actually trying to fend off germs. You mean like doing what you're actually <laughs> supposed to be doing your entire life? But now, you know, we're getting sicker, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't, you know, whatever. It, it is what it is. Yes. It is what it is. Okay. All right. Let's go and let's do some shout outs. Some shout outs. I was thinking about it. I would definitely take pizza, man. I see people leaving sometimes like a half empty pizza. Like, that's fucking ridiculous. Give that to somebody. Uh, I mean, why not just take it home at that point? That's what I don't understand. Maybe they're on a date. I had a very big discussion once with a friend of mine about he thinks, or he thought, I should say, that the reason that he didn't get a second date was because he asked for a to-go container do you think getting food to go on a date cancels your prospects for getting a second or third or another date with that person like if a man gets a to-go <laughs> container is he shutting down his date prospects i don't think it matters i don't think i think at that point that the night's obviously coming to an end and i i think the decision's already been made i don't think it would matter to the other person whether you got it to go or not. I, I, if anything, I think it shows a little restraint, a little discipline that you're willing to box up food and take it home. I don't know. I could see it early on in the dating process. I could see getting a to-go container early on in dating as a little bit of a, hmm, <laughs> he didn't eat all his food <laughs> no. and he got a to-go container. I could see some judgment. I could see it. 
I mean, you're talking to the wrong person, though. I'm the. I mean, let's not forget. I I was stood up twice and had to box up two very nice steak dinners and take home. That sounds uh, like a good deal, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, so I paid for all of it. Um, oh, they got the dinner and then left. Oh, that's the worst. Yeah. Got, well, at least you got. Well, you technically got both dinners then. <laughs> Yeah, but everybody so really that's a win win for you if you think about it. Once you get past yourself your crushing self confidence. But everybody knows that uh leftovers are not the same. Like if you get a steak at a steakhouse, the le- the leftover steak the next day is not is not anywhere near when it was first made. Yeah, some things you can't really heat back up. I would make an argument that Italian food is generally better the second time around. <laughs> I mean, Especially I, if you fry, if you put it in a little saucepan, heat it up. I'd, I would actually cook spaghetti, cook it all the way through, let it cool down, then reheat it in like a frying pan. It's way better. I'm gonna do that tonight. <laughs> I mean, oh yeah. Well, we are three hours. I was gonna say it's getting kind of late to have dinner, but we are three hours apart. So, um, yeah. Okay. All right, all right. Let's get to what people care about here. Some shout outs. Uh, let's start off with Landon Hull, Isaiah Lopez, Toby Flenderson. I like that name, Toby. A lot of good Tobys in the world, I feel. Okay. Uh, Val Curry, who I feel like I know, but I, I, I'm guessing I don't know because I... The name is familiar. You don't know a lot of Vals yeah. generally, but I feel like I have heard that name before. Uh, Carter Cummings. Corey Rodriguez, Brendan Murphy, Joe Garay, Susan Perry, and Rob Bergeron. Uh, all right, let's see a couple of uh, bangers for you. Uh, who would you rather be a part of or have by your side in a in a in a in a fight? The Power Rangers or the Mighty Ducks? The Power Rangers. They've got superpowers. What are the Mighty Ducks going to be? They're a bunch of children. They're going to get their ass kicked. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. The, the <laughs> I don't know. The question seemed a lot better when I was writing it down. Yeah. How many children under the age of... Okay. Do you think... How many children, seven and under, do you think that you could fight off? <laughs> you think you could beat ten children? Yes. But, but... You don't get to, like, hit one, and then the rest of them get a message. They learn nothing from what happened to their fellow competitors, right? Like, <laughs> they don't hold back just because you just rocked little Timmy. No, I mean, I think by by sheer – I mean, unless unless they're not going to go down easy. Like, You're talking seven-year-olds, man. Now, okay, so I have a seven-year-old boy who, if I'm not paying attention, he can get me. Like if I'm kind of, if we're kind of like paying attention and I'll usually be like down on my knees in the basement or something like wrestling around with them. Mm-hmm. If I'm focused on the other one and he like bull charges me and I don't see it, he can knock me down. So a seven year old is capable of taking you down if you're not, if you don't see it coming. I'm saying that that's, that's, you're talking about a 40 to 50 pound person. I just feel like 10, it would be doable. 20, no. Yeah. I don't think you could go to 20. 10, I would say 10 to yeah. Yeah. Ten I think I think I could do it. And if you give me a weapon, not a gun or something like that, but if you give me like a stick or a chair, I could I I'd go up to fifteen. But here's the other thing though, dude. Are you really just gonna haul off and like deck a seven year old? Yeah. Like you're gonna just uppercut some like six year old kid, like Mortal Kombat. Yeah, if they're coming at me. I don't think you could do that. I don't see you gotta you gotta factor in the fact that you're not gonna be able to go hundred percent. I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, like, well, 10 of them, if I choke out the first couple, well, then we're down to f- seven or six. And then if I punch them out, then now we're, you but know. But you're not, but see, but you're not going to be able to choke them out, right? Because there's nine other ones going to swarm you. So you got to be, it's got to be like, pop, pop, pop. it's got to be quick hits. You got to take them out fast or they're going to put you down. I mean, you got to get violent. And I don't know if you could do that with a child. But now you're talking about stamina, too, which is another thing that I don't think people r- realize. I think it actually would be about five, I think. Unless you were really just going to, like, be ruthless. I mean, 
if I'm I on think if, you're probably if, five to ten. If I'm in the if I'm in the field of battle and they know what they're up against, then sure, then all bets are off. Now if I'm like at the school playground or something and little Timmy's coming up to me just to, the horse around, no, of course I'm not gonna throw him into a the side of the school then stomp on his chest. I would say to maybe provide a little bit of context to this. So I have a seven year old and a four year old <laughs> and I'll get a little tired, but that's like containing yourself to make sure that you're not like hurting them. Oh. But you, they, they'll get you. I think five is a lot more than you would think. I think five strong seven year olds are going to give you a little bit of trouble. You know what? I'll just bust out my cell phone and then that, then it's over. All eyes will oh, go yeah, to the you cell phone. Distract them. That's how you do it. You play YouTube videos, and then that's yeah. There that's you go. Insane, that's a good strategy. Man. Use your use your stuff. Okay. Well, obviously the answer is like I would rather have the Power Rangers on my side. Give me the like. I tell you, like man. Give me Goldberg. Give me the then. Bash Brothers. I mean, I'm not worried. Emilio about Estevez. They're gonna get bashed. Oh boy. Uh I, I've always thought though that kind of brings up another point to me is that I've always thought the Power Rangers were a little overblown little overrated it's fictional dude right like it's a tv show yeah but they can be overrated which they are it was a big thing for a moment it was legitimately big like it never carried into i don't think any of the subsequent seasons and i don't think it ever carried into any of the 15 different offshoots that they had but they were a big deal when they came out initially I mean, that first season was that was big it was a game changer can you name the original five colors of the Rangers? Uh, black, yellow, blue, red, green, and then they also had a white one. I don't. Right? I don't know if that's right. I feel like there's a pink Ranger in there. Oh, there is. That's the one I forgot. Pink. Well, I forgot the pink one. Well, anyways, let's just move on. Um, okay. Say you're out getting coffee, and it's uh, September. You know, early September. How do you feel if someone in front of you orders something pumpkin flavored in the beginning of September? Too soon? Right time? Uh, my honest answer is I pay no attention to what other people are doing. If that's what you want to get, that's what you're going to get. Now, if it looks appetizing to me, that's the only reason. I'm not going to be, it's not going to change my choice. It's not going to change how I feel about them. And I'm pretty sure that you can kind of tell what somebody's going to order before they get up there right like if you're ordering a pumpkin spice latte in the beginning of september september i know what you look like <laughs> do you want to you want to characterize that I, mean, I don't think that i don't think that i need to go into any details but if you're going <laughs> ordering a pumpkin spice latte in the beginning of september i know what you look like i also know that you probably spent a lot of time looking for taylor swift tickets <laughs> Wow, you're you're really like putting out two huge fan bases there. I will say this about Taylor Swift and the phenomenon that has become her is I didn't get it, uh, but now my four going on five year old has learned some of her songs and will not stop singing them. And it's just, I mean, she she transcends ages. Like her songs are catchy. Yeah. I think that they are catchy, but I think that ultimately what Taylor Swift does and what that audience ultimately is, is essentially bringing women back to high school. I mean, I, I agree to disagree because I feel like that's what the boy band era is for and, and was for. But the boy band is more like teenage girls first attraction. That's the big thing about them. Like those are the first boys that teenage girls really like. Well, let's stay in the music beat for a second, because uh, okay, we lost uh, we lost two two musicians within 24 hours. Uh, so obviously, we're recording this Monday comes out on Wednesday, so it'll be a couple days old by then. But uh, we lost Jimmy Buffett, and we lost the lead singer of Smash Mouth, uh, all within a couple days of each other. Which I know you were a huge Smash Mouth fan. What is the big Smash Mouth song? I honestly can't think of it. I mean, I know their music, but I don't know what the song is. So they had they had the uh, I'm I'm actually looking them up because I know they had the Shrek song, I'm a Believer. Oh, okay. Uh, they had All Star, and then they had uh, Walking on the Sun, as well, which I think was their first big hit. Uh, so, anyways, um, moving on to Jimmy Buffett. 
Uh, I will say this with all due respect to him, because obviously he's passed now. Uh, I, I never understood, nor did I like like his music. I, I could care less that he was on a boat and played island songs, and I, I just I, I never cared. It was not for me. I don't think it's necessarily about his music as much as it's about the experience that he provided and the feeling that he gave the people of just relaxing, having a good time, taking life easy. I think his concerts were a lot of fun. I think that that's basically what it really was. It's kind of like the Grateful Dead in some ways, right? Like the concert is an experience in a lifestyle. That's fair. That's, that's actually a great way to, to sum it up. Listen, I think there's no better way to honor Mr. Buffett oh, and Mr. Harwood. Okay. okay. Oh, I see where you're going. Then with the... With, then with... Then with Candle of the Month, I like how you somehow transition from two posthumous famous musicians into Candle of the Month, <laughs> as if that's okay. All right, so here's – it's time. How do we do the horse? How do you do the horse? No, that's not a horse. I can never do the horse. I mean, that's not bad. That's not bad. Candle of the Month, the outlaw candle connoisseur rides again. <laughs> <laughs> Someday we're gonna get yeah, that like on a board. Stuck in my teeth. Uh, so this one was actually an accident uh, that I stumbled upon. Um, a coworker of mine gave me this and said that they didn't want it, knew it was on the candles, and I said, "Okay, well, I'll take it." And uh, I lit it up about a week ago, uh, and and I'm I'm absolutely in love with it until I found out how much it costs. But if you can get over the the price tag of what it is. Um, I, I think you'll enjoy it. So uh, Nest New York is the company. Uh, the candle is Pumpkin Chai Classic Candle. That's the name of it, uh, obviously. Okay. I, I uh, We went through, I don't want to say a, a cold spell last week here in Michigan, but it was like, you know, 70s during the day, got into the low 50s at night. Uh, it was like 95 today, by the way, but that doesn't matter. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna bust out. I'm gonna bust out this candle and check it out, see what it's up to. Uh, just amazing. Okay. Just there, it was fall in my house for a week, and then obviously I'm like, well, now it's 90 uh, degrees again today, and we're running the air conditioning. Uh, so I'm gonna tone it down a bit. But two things I like about this candle, which it's a little different for me. One, uh, it's it's only the classic. It's only the the. It's a two wick. But it's supposedly going to last for 80, 80 hours. 60 to 80 hours is a two-wick. Whoa, I don't know about that. Yeah, I don't know, I don't two know either. Two-wicker, 80 hours? Um, the other thing is the presentation, like the little uh, glass container it's in is really cool. And I'm actually kind of excited. One of the things I, I actually do is if I have some leftover wax from other candles is I combine the candles and make them into, you know, Re refurbished candles, whatever you want to call them. So I'm looking for the glass. The glass is cool. However, I say all this. I looked up the price of the classic, which is what I what I have, and it's forty eight dollars just for the candle. Ooh! So you're probably looking at sixty bucks, including shipping, which is a lot. Um, but if you can get over that, it really is a fantastic candle. And uh, like I said, I got mine just kind of by accident because the person didn't want it. I would have gladly paid for it, um, and I, I maybe I will in the future for other candles from this company. Um, but yeah, it's it's awesome. Remind reminded me of fall, uh, you know, fake fall uh, until we got back to summer here. So, so uh, let's just call it a fifty dollar candle. Now, how many hours are you usually going to like get out of a fifty hour candle? What I'm asking you basically is like that's a long burn, eighty hours. Is that ultimately worth it, though? Like, yeah, you're paying a little bit more, but you're getting a little bit more, too. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, it, it, it's definitely worth it. However, I think, like, even I've become accustomed to a lot of these candle companies, uh, not the ones on Etsy, not like the creative candle uh, makers, they'll call them, but, you know, the, the companies like Target, Bed Bath & Beyond, etc. Uh, I know, it's hard to keep a straight face. Um, I mean, they have deals. Really so, is, so you can really get three is. for 20 Right. Or, or you can get, you know, three for Ooh. 30, whatever. Um, so, yeah. But once again, I mean, they say like doing doing a little research here in the burn time. They say like a three wick can last you up to 100 hours. A luxury, which cost one hundred and ninety dollars. 
will last you wow. up to one hundred and twenty dollars. Now, listen, I, I I knew it. That's a f- I knew this. I knew this was going to happen eventually. What? Your snobbery has now gone into the candles. <laughs> now you can't yeah. get just to like the three for twenty. Now John's not happy unless it's a fifty dollar candle. Your snobbery has gone into candles. Well, obviously, the three wicks are three wick. The luxury is a four wick. The classic is, uh, like I said, it's it's a one or two. Uh, it looks like here, at least, uh, from one of the pictures I was looking at from the different candles. You can also get a, a, a votive or votive, uh, which is a smaller version for 20 bucks that has about a 30 hour burn time, which is probably good enough, you know, probably good enough for most people, but. And this is the time of the show I would like to remind people that, yes, John has had sex at least <laughs> twice. He does have two children, despite his massive candle knowledge. He has uh, been intimate with a woman before, which is <laughs> quite... I'm not... Do they ever have any... Just Do they have any chair... Do they have any candles that are just like one simple thing, like pumpkin, apple, or is it all fancy stuff? Is it all just fancy names? <laughs> I mean... Green Rush... I mean, if I, I mean, uh, at this company, everything's pretty fancy. I mean, most of them are, are, are fancy, I guess. I mean, like some of the, you know, you have Moroccan amber, autumn plum, yeah, you know, mm. Amalfi lemon and mint. I mean, that just makes me want to buy it. Just the name alone. Hmm. Did you also hold back a little bit of a vomit burp just a second ago? It, it has been a pretty fun day at my household. So, yes, I am holding. Oh, uh, okay. All right. I'm, all right. I saw that. I'm holding down barbecue and liquor and beer. And I think I'm doing a great job, though. Did, oh, you had barbecue. Did you put ketchup on it? Uh, no, I did not. Uh, this was just basic okay. right. hamburgers, hot dogs, which, of course, why would I put ketchup on those? Yeah, don't call bar- hamburgers and hot dogs barbecue, okay? That's not barbecue. You're trying to class things up. I'm not. I'm not. Hamburgers and hot dogs is not barbecue. It's a cookout, all right? Don't try to class it up and say it's barbecue. What's the difference between a barbecue and a cookout? They're the same thing. If you, if you don't know, I can't explain it to you, all right? Anybody <laughs> who's a real know. pit master, anybody who's a real pit master knows the difference. Cookout, man, that's just having some fun. You're having some people over. You're having some hamburgers, hot dogs, maybe wings. If you're getting into a barbecue, that's talking about putting a pig in the ground, maybe. You're having some brisket. You're having, like, some rack of lamb, a shoulder or something like that. I shouldn't have to explain this to you. You're the guy who's supposed to be a barbecue Um, person. You should know these things. It's. I think the, the, the classification of the hangout, it doesn't matter to me. It's a barbecue, a cookout. Oh, well, yeah. Whatever. I would expect that from a casual fan. I also bought a slip and slide. I would expect that so. kind of stuff. Did you really? Did. did you go on the slip and slide? No. It was, did it, you it, didn't get hurt. It, it was a little kid one. When I, I was actually kind of put off by it because it wasn't as, as – the kids loved it. But I was like, this doesn't seem like if I was to go on it, I would slide down the end. How much did you pay for it? <laughs> it was- on clearance, I got it for four dollars. Well, no, yeah, dude, you got a four dollar slip and slide. What did you think? There's gonna launch him into space? <laughs> it was seventy five percent. I mean, it's a decent slip. It's from the company that makes slip and slides. It's still only sixteen dollars if it's seventy five percent off. <laughs> I think if that math is correct, right? Like, Listen, what are you expecting? Do you know how you many know? slip and slides they sell a year? Okay, they can put them at sixteen dollars. Yeah, but still, like, I'm not really expecting a lot. I would think a slip and slide needs to be in the fifty to a hundred dollar range if you're really like expecting to like go somewhere with it. <laughs> Just get a tarp. Just get a tarp and hose it down. It's the same thing, maybe a little bit more dangerous, but the kids can heal. <laughs> well, he's from Kansas, folks. Toughen them up, man. Toughen them up. All right, are you ready for our top five? I'm feeling snacky and a little bit tacky. Okay, our top five is top five snacks. Actually, it's top five types of snacks, not individual snacks, right? We're not going to go through 20 different kinds of chips. That can be a different one. We're doing top five types of snacks. What's your number five? Uh, Seeds, like sunflower seeds, uh, pumpkin seeds, you know, those type of things. 
No, it's a waste of time. That's a waste. Seeds are a waste of everybody's time. Seeds is the thing. Like, why? Why would you eat seeds? That's not even a snack. Like, oh, I'm going to fill up on these pumpkin seeds and have 40,000 of them. Well, it, it, it's a snack. So you're not, I'm not trying to get necessarily filled up. And you can spend two to three hours snacking on a handful of sunflower. Well, I, I mean, some people can, but either way, they they're it's a longevity snack, and it's it's not they're not terrible for you, and it's it's uh it's good, man. Seeds, seeds are seeds are fun. They you know, if you can properly seed, it's it's a good it's fun. It's too much work, right? Seed to me is just like that's the wor- if are we doing top five worst snacks? Because there I would agree with seeds on there, right? Like number one, you don't get anything out of them, and you got to put in way too much effort. It's just a terrible. That's a diet. spoken like somebody that has never properly seeded a sunflower before. Oh yeah, see that's what I'm talking about. Mr. Snob. That You're did going sound snob snobby. That did sound snobby. You are correct. You don't even know how to seed a sunflower, right? You know all the lingo, but apparently don't know the difference between a barbecue and a cookout. <laughs> you were right. That sounded snobby. You were right. That was really snobby. It was like level nine, eight. Was... I'm not I was gonna say nine, but it's probably it's pretty you, you were correct. pretty high up there, right? You got a T-shirt that's talking about seeding. You got a sneed, seeding convention later. You can go onto your Facebook page that you all have. Talk about spitting it up the left side of your mouth versus the right, right listen, side. You listen, have that whole discussion. What's your number five for your face gets red? Cheese puffs. Cheese puffs. Keep it with the people. Mm. Give me a big tub of cheese puffs, the kind that you can get that's like <laughs> ridiculous at the grocery store for $7. But, but I, I I think of cheese puffs and chips as the same thing. Well, they're not. Okay. All right. No one would ever be like, hey, do you have any chips? And you're like, yeah. And you just bring out cheese puffs. No, you're like, no, I got the puffs. They're not chips. They're puffs. Different thing. Right? If I ask for chips and you bring me popcorn, that's not the same thing. Uh, what's your number four? So my number four is ice cream. I don't really consider that to be a snack. And if you did consider that to be a snack, it's certainly not number four. <laughs> yeah, it's it's at number four. It's 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 a. I mean, list. Okay, fine. Uh, ice cream, yogurt, frozen yogurt. I can, I mean, whatever. Frozen treats, I guess, maybe that's my number four, but I, I'm thinking predominantly I ice cream. I don't think of ice cream as a snack. It's a dessert. No, a dessert is a dessert. Ice cream is a snack. How much you weigh now? <laughs> <laughs> Two. <laughs> well, well, let's, uh, let's, let's move, move on. on. Uh, my number four, I don't personally really care for these. Right, I don't personally care for it, but I think that they have to be acknowledged, and that's the impact of mixed nuts. A lot of people like mixed nuts. I mean, that essentially was my number five, just without the nuts. Seeds. Just, yeah, they're in mixed nuts. They're not. Mixed nuts does not usually contain seeds, and if it does, it's not the kind of mixed nuts that I'm buying. Keep those little things out of my mixed nuts. I want big nuts. Only the biggest nuts go in this mouth. <laughs> I only want big nuts in my mouth. If you got little nuts, put them in somebody else's mouth. I want the biggest nuts in my mouth. Two big old cashews. Just fill up these cheeks okay. with nuts. Okay. Uh, my, my number three... Uh, oh, that's my number three, too, is popcorn. I agree. I think that's the appropriate place for popcorn. Kind of with what you said for your uh, nut nut choice. Um, I mean, I, I don't mind popcorn. Popcorn's okay. It, I mean, it deserves to be on a snack list. But I'm kind of, uh, you know, obligatorily putting it in at number three. I think popcorn at number three is, like, exactly where it should be. I have a, one really good popcorn that I really enjoy, but it gets stuck in your teeth. And it fucking drives me crazy, man. Right? Like it's, oh, hey. it's uh, all right. My number two is uh, pizza rolls. Oh, God. I do love fucking pizza rolls. Yeah, those are good. Yeah. Okay, those are good. I got nothing bad to say against pizza rolls. I have no problem with okay. pizza rolls. All right. 
my my number two is chips. Okay, my uh, I actually don't have chips on my top five. You don't have chips on your top five snacks. I don't, and I think it's just because I don't eat a lot of chips. I mean, I, I do like chips, but when I when I eat them, it's usually with a barbecue. Okay. Are you sure you don't have them in a cookout? I have them at a cookout slash barbecue slash hangout, whatever you want to call it. Um, my number one are like snack crackers, like Cheez-Its, Triscuits. Um, I don't know what the proper term is for them. I guess crackers, I'm not going to put but that's... wheat. I'm not going to put like wheat thin or Triscuit in there at all. Like those aren't necessarily oh, very so... good. Cheez-It, I feel so like good. it's really a chip. But I know it's technically a cracker, but it's more like chip based. It's it's a cracker, man. It's a oven baked cracker. Yeah, but I don't think of Cheez Its the same way that I think of Triscuits. If somebody's like, "Hey, you would you like some Cheez Its?" Like, yeah, of course. And they come back with Triscuits or Wheat Thins, and be like, "This isn't the same thing." I mean, like, I also not that I I put this at number one for this reason, but like Oreos could be considered a cracker. I think that because there's two sides, cookie, dude. Come on. There's two sides to everything. It's a cracker cookie. There's two sides to everything. A okay, chip well, has two you're sides. You're right. You're right. It's a cookie. It's yeah, a cookie. Exactly. It's My fun. number one is trail mix. I love trail mix. If you <sighs> put chocolate in there, man, especially if you go like M and M's trail mix. The only problem that I have with a trail mix is kind of like your thing with the nuts. Is is the nuts take over? And all you want really is the M and M's or the chocolate or the raisins or the craisins, and you get more nuts than you do Not anything if you else. Get some good trail mix, man. You've got to find better trail mix that's a more proportionate mix. Like you're getting too much trail, yeah. not enough mix. Tell Costco to up their game. Oh yeah, you got to get better stuff, then, man. Go to like a, I don't know a grocery store. Just look at one. <laughs> How are you buying seventy dollar candles, but you won't like pay an extra dollar for good trail mix? <laughs> well, that's how I can afford. Well, th- those candles is because I save a buck here or there and eat McDonald's. Has your every wife day. ever had to be like John? We got to cut back on candles this week, and you're like, no. But I only but she's like she's like it's part of the budget. Is it in the budget? Is candles in? Is there a line for candles in the monthly show budget? No, no. There, there was only one time where she questioned me, and it was right after we started doing this segment on the regular. Mm. And I went a little nuts, and I bought like nine or ten candles from about six different companies, and they all arrived within like three days of each other. And she was like, "Are you getting paid for this? Like, what, what's I'm happening just, here?" I was like, "No, I just, I just love candles. Yeah, that's like two or three hundred dollars worth of candles. That was a lot I'd of be candles. Fucking that's pissed. Be like, you're doing I'd what?" Be- <laughs> uh, let's see what yeah i actually have a lot uh beef jerky i go back and forth on beef jerky i don't think it's a top 10 snack personally but i do i'll eat it uh I, this is probably under candy but i i feel like candy was so broad so i put gummy bears down yeah dude that's a candy yeah but like I don't know. It's so not really a candy that anybody bears. actually wants. Um, granola bars, fruit. I could do granola. Now, granola can be a good one. My personal favorite uh, out of all of these decisions. However, I knew you were going to argue if it was a snack or not, and I didn't want to fight you on it or, or try to debate you, and that is charcuterie. I don't actually know what that is. Is that meats and cheeses? Yes. If it's charcuterie, right? Like if it's got its own label, just like with ice cream, it's ice cream. It's not a snack, right? Like chips are a snack. Nuts are a snack. Salty oh, nuts. Get more salty nuts. Oh, lick them. I'd lick those nuts if I could. If I can't eat it, I'll just lick them. 